about to call the meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is the swearing in of our newly elected officials and our re elected officials. So, Jeremy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, we are glad to have Judge Baldwin here with us today to swear in Chris Norholz, who will be serving a second term, as well as our first term board members, Stephen Pettit and Stacey Young. So, at this time, Judge Baldwin, if you would, please come up as we swear in Mr. Norholz first. All right, if you just place your left hand on the bottom and your right hand forward, just right from this way. You'll repeat after me. I, Chris Norholtz. I, Chris Norholtz. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will truly and faithfully. That I will truly and faithfully discharge all the duties. Discharge all the duties. Required of me by law. Required of me by law. As a member of the Gainesville City Board of Education. As a member of the Gainesville City Board of Education. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. I do further solemnly swear. I do further solemnly swear and affirm and affirm that I'm not the holder that I'm not the holder of any public money of any public money. I do this state unaccounted for? Do this state unaccounted for? That I'm not the holder that I'm not the holder of any office of trust of any office of trust of, under the government of the United States under the government of the United States nor of either of the several states nor either of the several states nor of any foreign state nor of any foreign state. And that I am otherwise qualified, and that I am otherwise qualified to hold said office, to hold said office, according to the Constitution of the United States, according to the Constitution of the United States, and the laws of Georgia, and the laws of Georgia, and then I will support the Constitution of the United States, and then I will support the Constitution of the United States, and of this state, and of this state. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. We've not gotten very involved. Congratulations. Stephen, if you would place your left hand on the bottom and raise your right hand. I, Stephen Pettit. I, Stephen Pettit. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will truly and faithfully. That I will truly and faithfully. Discharge all the duties. Discharge all the duties. Required of me by law. Required of me by law. As a member of the Gainesville City Board of Education. As a member of the Gainesville City Board of Education. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. I do further solemnly swear. I do further solemnly swear and affirm and affirm that I'm not the holder of any public money due. That I'm not the holder of any public money due. The state unaccounted for. The state unaccounted for. That I'm not the holder of any office. That I'm not the holder of any office of trust under the government of the United States. Of trust under the government of the United States. Nor either of the several states. Or either of the several states. Nor of any foreign state. Nor of any foreign state. And that I am otherwise qualified to hold said office. And I'm otherwise qualified to hold said office. According to the Constitution of the United States. According to the Constitution of the United States. And the laws of Georgia. And the laws of Georgia. And I will support the Constitution of the United States. And I will support the Constitution of the United States. And of this state. And of this state. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. <laughs> You know, now that I've done it twice, you probably won't need me to break it up, right? Raise <laughs> 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 well, your left hand, Bible, raise your right hand if you have any. I, Stacy T. Young. I, Stacy T. Young. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will truly and faithfully discharge all the duties. That I will truly and faithfully discharge all, all my duties. 
required of me by law, required of me by law as a member of the Gainesville City Board of Education, as a member of the Gainesville City School Board of Education, to the best of my ability, to the best of my ability. I do follow to further solemnly swear, I do further solemnly swear and affirm and affirm that I am not the holder of any public money, that I'm not the holder of any public money, do this state unaccounted for, do this state unaccounted for, that I'm not the holder of any office, that I'm not the holder of any office of trust under the government of the United States, of trust under the government of the United States, nor of either of the several states, nor of either of the several states, nor of any foreign state, nor of either foreign state, and that I'm otherwise qualified to hold said office. Now, get it again, please. And that I am otherwise qualified to hold said office. I'm otherwise qualified to hold said office according to the Constitution of the United States, according to the Constitution of the United States, and laws of Georgia, and laws of Georgia. And I will support the Constitution of the United States. And that I will support the Constitution of the United States. And of this state. And of this state. So help me God. So help me God. Oh, yeah. Um, if y'all need to leave, this would be a good time to do so. Yeah. Thanks, Happy Michael. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We did tell the uh, new board members that I have a quiz at the end about all of our principals and directors that are here. <laughs> Uh, next item on the agenda is the election of the board officer in 2024. Is there a nomination for the board chair? I would like to nominate uh, Mr. Andrew Stewart to serve as board chair for this year. Second. Second. Second by Dr. Andy. All those in favor? Motion carries. Uh, second item is the election of the board vice chairman. I would like to nominate Chris Lord Holmes as board vice chairman. Second. Right. Uh, motion is second. All those in favor? Thank you, Aries. Last item is treasurer. Uh, I'd like to nominate Dr. Heather Ramsey as the board treasurer. Second. 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 Motion carries. All right, do we have any board commendations? Hearing none, we'll move on. Are there any citizen comments? There are none. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. Okay. A motion by Dr. Ramsey. Uh, I'd like to second that, and could I add to that uh, the adoption of number six and seven, the consent agenda? Uh, yes. Got, got a, a motion by Dr. Ramsey, an amendment by Mr. Nordholz. Uh, all those in favor? Motion carries. Um, all right. We're on the new, new business action items. Uh, the school calendar for 2024 2025, Dr. Uh, yeah, the items of information. Yeah, our funds. Got your big ethics. Like the time on the Yeah, so you have before you. We do this every January. This is not just for our existing board member or new board members, but also existing board members. Uh, we annually sign the Board of Ethic uh, Conflict of Interest. You have a copy of that provided to you. Uh, we will keep the signed copy. You also have a copy of the board norms. And so uh, every year we do provide this information to you. It is something we're required to submit as a part of our board recognition program as well. So if you're not if you've not done so and signed that, we will do so uh, before the end of the meeting. And Ms. Lizette will uh, keep those on file for us. That is all I have, Mr. Chairman. All right, sorry, I uh, uh, miscounted. Uh, Mrs. Pethel, uh, would you like to give us uh, some comments on the 
FY25 budget timeline. Yeah. Um, specifically, FY25 budget timeline. Um, and then this is pretty much set up as we do every year. Um, we'll begin by meeting with the schools to review FY24 um, expenditures and training and everything that we're going to have. We'll also meet with the department head um, here in February and then um, we'll start meeting to be presenting budgets like they would be for you all and others uh, during March. Um, also, um, in Board of Education meetings, we'll have with you all during March as well. We will plan on typically adopting the budget in May at the regular work session. And then in between the tentative and the final uh, adoption, if we have a proposed tax increase, um, then probably tax we'll have to have those numbers ready for us during June as well. So we are required, this is uh, just so y'all are aware, when Ms. Kat, Ms. Ms. Pepple and I first came on board, uh, we did a different time with the budget adoption, which has to be completed by the end of June. And it usually wasn't until August or September that we really adopted the middle of Drake. Uh, after our first year, we were able to move all of that up and get it complete by the end of June. So there is a requirement uh, under state board law that says that we need to have two budget hearings a year. And so what we do is we double those up and if, if we go ahead and schedule three so that if we do have to have millage rate hearing, it satisfies both the budget requirement and the millage rate requirement. Uh, these are the dates we used last year. Uh, and so those are, are tentative at this time. Uh, we hope they will not change, but we'll know more as we get into May. But we want to provide you this timeline. Uh, so you can go ahead and have that through your calendars. For Mr. Young, Mr. Pettit, uh, Dr. Williams will be meeting with you either individually or with another board member to uh, go over some of these numbers in this whole project. So when you see when you see the uh, education budget meeting, some of that we will do in a large group setting. Uh, some of it also may be smaller that will then all get shared when we do the tentative adoption. Uh, it's just a good way for you to be able to ask questions and learn more about our budgeting process. Ms. Peff will usually attend those meetings as well. Are there any questions of Dr. Williams or Mrs. Peff? Thank you, Mrs. Peff. Uh, next up, uh, Donna Allen to go over our choice enrollment dates. Good evening. Um, just want to uh, present to you our choice enrollment timeline for the 2024-2025 school year. Um, we had two minor revisions on the dates. Our press release did release to Gainesville Time and Media on January the 9th. And um, today is our first day where we're starting choice enrollment. And choice enrollment in our district um, uh, is the opportunity for parents to select the choice of their school at the elementary and middle level, middle grade levels within their clusters. We have cluster A and cluster B. Um, we also have um, lined up our pre-K lottery sign up, which will begin in February, February 1st to 16th, along with our drawing. That would take place immediately after that. Uh, while simultaneously working on kindergarten enrollment. So as you can see, we have a lot, <laughs> a lot of enrollment that takes place here um, at the board office as well as the school. Um, we also do our currently enrolled um, choice enrollment forms. Um, and then we also, beginning February 1st, we'll be working with our parents who do pay tuition. We'll start off with those um, currently enrolled non-residents, and then we will open up um, enrollment for newly enrolling non-resident families. And then acceptance and denial letter, letters will go home beginning March 1st. That is a, um, another uh, revision. So parents will be notified beginning March 1st. Any questions? So every year, our goal is to basically break these down into two week intervals. So you don't have a lot of overlapping of the two, pre-K and kindergarten choice enrollment and so forth. And at the same time, the schools have been working on that fifth to sixth grade transition and what those parent meetings look like and all the school visits from elementary to middle schools, as well as that eighth and ninth grade transition. And so these next couple months are really a busy time uh, for registration and our, our student enrollment. Just have a lot going on and just really a testament to how well our principals over the last number of years are very welcoming to our kids that are coming to the middle schools and the high school. And uh, we're glad we have, have it structured in a way now that really maximizes everybody's time. I will say pre-K numbers are going down this year. Uh, we've been able to have 22 kids in the class uh, for the last number of years. That is now going down to 20. 
so uh, just so you know, that's a, a state requirement that we've been dropping. That's been dropping. We have a, about half of our classes are full, and some of them are right at that number. Uh, so it's not going to impact us greatly. So that's still the opportunity uh, for 12 classes with 20 kids apiece uh, being served across the district. Uh, pre-K is the is the dropping of class sort of mandate? Is that funded by the state? Yeah, so need additional teachers. So we have uh, right from the start mm -hmm. where the pre-K program is through. They do not fund the teachers at the level we receive for all of our other teachers, uh, but uh, we, we invest in paying our pre-K teachers the same as we do all of our others, because we know that's a special location that a pre-K teacher may not have the, the same desire as being a fourth or fifth grade teacher. Uh, that's why we don't have a lot of turnover, honestly, in, in pre-K, is because we compensate them the same way. So the state does send us money to help offset about $30,000 of their costs. Um, but that's not being impacted, just yeah. the side class sizes. Are there any, <clears throat> any other questions of uh, Mrs. Allen? Thank you, Mrs. Allen. Yeah. Yeah. For action items uh, now, uh, the 24, 25 school calendar. So other than want to know if we're having school or not, this is probably <laughs> the next biggest um, <laughs> topic that a lot of people want to always look at. So the last few years, we've been able to uh, put out a school calendar that is very similar to how it has been the previous year. This year is no different. To give you an idea of what we do is we send this out to our principals who then take it to their governance councils for feedback. They then send those to us and we look and see what are some of the discrepancies or some similarities. And this year there were very few. Uh, we do look at Hall County Schools because we realize that we may have employees who kids send their kids there. All county schools, they have employees who send their kids to us. And so we try to align as much as we can with some of the uh, all county schools and some neighboring districts. Uh, to to kind of go over some of the high points here, you see the pre-planning week is July 29th through August the 5th. This current school year, we made an adjustment in how we uh, used our open house days. So prior to COVID, uh, open house was done in a three year or excuse me, a three hour interval on one day sometime during pre planning. So that meant a fourth grade teacher was having to meet 25 families in a two to three hour span and really never gave the families the attention that they needed. At the same time, as a family member, you're just drowning in all the paperwork that's coming in at that time. COVID allowed us to spread that out and we've kept that over the last couple of years. So on that Thursday and Friday, uh, we'll have open house. Uh, Pre-K all the way through 12th grade, and then a day set aside of those two days for orientation at Gainesville High School. Uh, that has worked well the, the last few years. We look forward to providing that again. It also allows the high school, when you look at a calendar like this, to have the weekend to make some schedule changes before kids come back on the 6th. Uh, in the past, we may have had orientation on one day, the next day, the first day of school. You can't resolve issues or questions uh, in that period of time. So you have Labor Day, then when we roll into September, October looks just like uh, we, we had uh, this year, which was two days, one day, of course, uh, being a holiday. We added on another day than the work day. It also coincides to be around the nine weeks ending uh, during that time as well. A week at Thanksgiving, uh, two weeks at the winter break. Staff will come back on Monday, uh, January the 6th. Students will come back on the 7th. Now, some people look at that and be like, why couldn't we do that this year? Uh, we were out on the 15th this year in December. This next year that pushes out to the 20th. So there's not a week before uh, Christmas like there was this year, uh, only about a handful of days, but everybody still gets the two weeks there uh, at the winter break. Celebrate MLK on the 20th. Uh, what's a little different this next February is we're able to have a holiday there uh, for President's Day followed by a work day. And then we add an additional uh, work day in March uh, just to be able to have a time prior to spring break, prior to all of the end of the year testing and everything else uh, for our staff. Uh, spring break is the week of 7th through the 11th. Uh, that does align with, with many districts across the state. It does seem a little bit later, uh, but, it, but it just looks later. Um, testing will, of course, be adjusted based on uh, the calendar the state gives us. And the one request that we get from teachers oftentimes is, please don't make us come back after Memorial Day. And so uh, we could have had other days built into the calendar, but it would have shifted our teacher work days to after Memorial Day. This allows us to have graduation on the 16th, uh, the last day of school for students on the 21st and the last day for staff 
on the 23rd, wrapping everything up uh, by the by Memorial Day. So very similar to this year with the addition of the February uh, holiday that's in there. Any questions? Do I have a motion to adopt the calendar? So maybe a motion by Mr. Norhold. They're here second. Second. Got a second by Dr. Ramsey. All those in favor? Motion carries. All right, Dr. Ramsey. I mean, Dr. Williams. Yeah. We have here, uh, when the alumni gym, the original alumni gym was demolished where the new student activity center is located, uh, we had a portability clause in the naming of the alumni gym. And at that time, uh, the board elected to transfer that name over to the new gym, which I was reminded the new gym is now over 20 years old, um, but to the alumni gym. Uh, since that time, we've had two individuals, uh, Coach Davis and Coach Hill, who were both very instrumental in the success of both of our girls and boys programs. Uh, so Jerry Davis and Manson Hill, uh, and they were inducted into the Gainesville Athletics Hall of Fame last year in 2023, uh, and they have both uh, won state titles, won numerous Lanier Land championships, and so uh, at this time, based on some information that was presented to the board a number of months ago, uh, we we're recommending uh, transferring or renaming the alumni gym to the Davis Hill Gym, and we would be looking at an event, uh, the first home game of the next basketball season. Uh, to bring both those men back, uh, as many players as we can, and just honor them in the uh, renaming of the alumni gym to the Davis Hills. Any questions? We have a motion to adopt the name change. Uh, so moved. We have a motion by Mr. Nordhold. Uh, here a second. So we've got a second by Mr. Young. All those in favor? Motion carries. All right, Ms. Spence. And now we we'll get to turn it over to Ms. Pebble. Remaining, remaining <laughs> the board meeting. I was thinking we plan next January. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 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 Thank you, Mr. So, so for our new board members, this report is one that you'll see usually every month. Sometimes we have to save a few months to, to wait for some things to clear out, or we may have a work session at the beginning of the month and the financials aren't ready for that month. Um, but, but this amount here is a, is a standard uh, template that Ms. Beth will report to us each month. Okay. Uh, our total revenues for the month of October was $6.3 Six eight three million expenditures for the month was seven point nine million. That's underneath the revenue center. Right. And just to expand on one thing that Dr. Williams talked a little bit about when we talked about pre-K and funding for uh pre-K and from Black and Sword, we do have to supplement that funding as we explained with the A above and beyond that amount. So that amount including our general fund budget, and that's under other outlays, which is that last one. Um, that's not exclusively uh, for big days for other programs as well, but the majority of that is for big days. So, um, back to our results. Um, our expenditure for the revenue for the month are at 1.2 million, uh, which is not unusual again, as we are not fully in season of our property tax collection. Our ending fund balance for October is seven point one million. Our ending fund balance at this time last year, I would like to kind of go back and get a picture of last year, was fifteen point eight million. But much of that is due to the timing of collection because this is a cash report. It's based on not the period ending that the city gives us the receipts for because they divide it into two different payments per month, but the actual receipt date that we receive the cash. Yeah, and you'll see in just a moment when we get to November and December that that's right. seven million. Um, right now looks like it trails October of 2022, but when you look at comparison uh, to December of 2022, we're much healthier uh, because the biggest drawback is when we get our money from the state, our funds from the state, it's divided over 12 months. And so that's why we always like to carry a nice reserve forward is so that we don't have to borrow money to pay our people. And so you can really see in October, the funds start to come back in. It really picks up in November and December. Uh, and so that's why you see that fluctuate quite a bit on the reserve. It's not because of spending, it's because the revenue really hasn't made its way through the ship. Okay, so we're at 
Yeah. Ms. Pepe, I'll also uh, point out for Mr. Young and Mr. Pettit, the, down at the bottom where you have the percentage of revenue and the percentage of expenditures at the same time last year, mm -hmm. that's always been helpful where you can just kind of see that we're tracking pretty close to how right, we, exactly. we did previous years. Especially on the expenditures line. The revenue slide, don't really explain that much. Like so you can see the our response receipts for the month of October was slightly over one million this month, at one million thirty-three thousand six sixty-one point thirty-two. And uh, we're keeping the momentum going. I think since the month of April, we've been uh, at over one million. So happy about that. And if you notice this number here from 2022, that's because uh, the new SPLOS kicked in, so it does not show the previous SPLOS there. This shows you the total SPLOS collections uh, that were in, in SPLOS 6. And can you remind us what exactly this SPLOS is paying for? Yeah, so this is paying off our bond indebtedness related to uh, Student Activity Center, Advanced Study Center, Gainesville Middle School West, Cafeteria Media Center, the pavilion, uh, the new instructional building. Uh, what is it not? Yeah. <laughs> Anything that you've seen go up over the last few years, 50% of that is paying for the bond indebtedness. And so uh, about $5 million a year is required uh, to pay off that debt. And then the rest of it we're able to use for excess, like Cedar Park and some other items that are coming up. And that bond is here going to the back of the budget uh, books, just for the information. It tells you annually how much we uh, And you know, here, uh, any more questions about the October financial statements? I need a motion to adopt the uh, October financial statements. So, yeah, a motion by Mr. Young. Do I hear a second? Second. A second by Mr. Norholz. All those in favor? No, I was trying to get a sorry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah. It's All right. Uh, November financial statements. Total revenues for the month were 18.5 million. Uh, and our total, that's total revenues, total receipts, which includes the state. Total receipts, property tax is 14.3 million, which again, they consider the job in the 37.9% of our excess total revenues uh, collected. Our expenditures were at 8.7 million, resulting in revenues over expenditures. That's a good thing for the month and amount of 9.7 million. And the revenue and the expenditures fluctuate a little bit also. And again, that's you know, when we pay for things, it's totally based on cash. So, and, and there was a lot of things that we have to pay for in July and August. Uh, a lot of our Georgia School Board Association fees are also due at that same time. A lot of technology purchases that we make are due at that time. So, that's why sometimes you may see, let's say we're 50% way through the year, but 75% of the funds have been spent because a lot of that had to be front loaded. And so, you won't see it uh, creep up quite like it, it is at that time. Yeah. Our income balance for November is 16.8 million compared to 14.8 million at this time last year. Uh, our, as you can see, our expenditures were at 41.6 percent to 43.4 percent for this year. So again, that's just a little bit of fluctuation on payment schedules. The next one. Sponsor receipts for the month of November were slightly over one million again at one million thirteen thousand three twenty-five point six eight. Right. Not uh, November. Are there any questions, Ms. Pepper, on the November statements? Do I hear a motion to adopt or accept the uh, financial statements from November? Mm -hmm. uh, motion by Dr. Ramsey. Here, second. Second by Mr. Young. All those in favor? Motion carries. All right, and finally, December. Mm -hmm. Property tax receipts for the month of December were 24. She's at 24.6 million, so uh, excited to have that receipt come in right before Christmas break. Let's try to put it on just a moment. That'll be a hard time. Oh, sorry. Well, yeah. That brings us up to 93.8% collective. Of course, we hope to exceed that. 
Is that a, like an all time high? Yeah, it's that. Don't worry, we're not getting any more taxes, so it's coming down. Here's the circuit. Yeah. This time last year, our income balance was 27.7 million, or 55.8% of our total revenue is collected. And I think our percentage of revenues for this year was up like 71%. Yeah. So we'll just call that up a little bit. Yeah, that, that $24 million we got in December yeah. was very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Like I said, that came the day before um, Christmas break. So, slash receipts for the month of December were again solid over $1,032,023.4. And that's not a little bit. And to give you an idea of, I mean, that's twelve and a half million dollars that was collected there, um, Ms. Pethel, I believe, what was the number? Six hundred fifty thousand is what we originally yeah. were budgeting for this loss, which comes out to seven point eight million. So almost, you know, over four and a half million more were collected than what was anticipated when we passed it three years ago. And all of this is proportionate with all county schools in Beaufort City. It's all based on our student enrollment. Is that extra revenue going into pay the bond debt or is it going? No, it's going in for special projects. Okay. The, the biggest thing is, is it's nice that the money has gone up, but also the cost of everything else has gone up. Right. And so in, in reality, it's probably all setting in a little bit. Um, but it's nice to be done with all of our major construction. <laughs> All right, any other questions regarding the December statements? A motion to accept the financial report for December. So we have a motion by Mr. Young. Is there a second? Second. A second by Dr. Ramsey. All those in favor? Motion carried. All right. Uh, resolution for the bank signature change. Yeah. At this time, I'd like to recommend approval for a resolution uh, to make the following changes in the district's policy uh, briefings. Deleting Mr. Smith and Mr. Mitchell and adding Mr. Spiller and Dr. Ramsey. So moved. We have a motion by Mr. Wardle. They're here second. We got a second by Mr. Young. All those in favor? Motion carried. No pressure, but I believe Ms. Beth and I. Said that this is the first time that's had to be done and since we've been here outside of our names. We did <laughs> edit it, so high expectations, guys. <laughs> Practice my signature. <laughs> All right, the uh, certificate of board instruction building. Now that we've completed the final phase of our capital outlay project, which Dr. Williams just named those. Um, being an instruction building is the final one where we have the board certified that all the invoices have been paid uh, in full by submitting this time certificate to that instruction. When this is submitted, we'll be entitled to receive our final funds in the amount of 1.2 million close out the project. Board members, I clicked one too many times. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is basically our, our lean waiver to. Get our final funds. So, yes, okay. and we, we've done this a couple of times for different um, programs, but this this should do it, right? Yes, it okay. Got a motion. So we got a motion by Mr. Young. They hear a second. Second. That's the second by Mr. Pettit. Yes. All in favor? Motion carries. And why don't we uh, budget amendment for FY twenty four? Yeah. I apologize for not being able to pull that up. Let me find my <laughs> There are a couple of times a year that Ms. Pepin will bring budget amendments to the board for various reasons. Some are uh, in case we have higher revenue than anticipated. There may be additional state funds that we proceed throughout the year that we do not anticipate. There may be federal programs, uh, that, and that's usually when it comes to is federal programs that we receive carryover funds that were not spent the previous year. And so we have to adjust our federal fund budgets. And just so y'all are aware, whatever we receive uh, and revenue from federal funds also has to be expanded. So it's a wash. Uh, anything coming in has to go out. So this particular budget amendment is partial for the year. It represents a $1,000 retention bonus uh, that has been outside the governor. 
out of pocket expense for the district was two hundred and thirty three thousand five fifty six. I propose that they increase the revenues and expenditures of the district by eight hundred percent. Um, the amount of revenue that we're expending, which is eight hundred forty five thousand three hundred twelve. That's what we see being said. And again, the expenditure amount of uh, unlimited funds in the August two thirty three five fifty six. So one of the things that when, when an announcement like that is made about we want to give everybody a thousand dollars, that sounds great and we appreciate it. And I know our employees appreciate it, but oftentimes that does not um, include all of the employees in the district. It's only the employees in which we earn funding for. So someone like Ms. Pethel, we didn't know well, we actually earned some funding for her, but think about our secretaries, most of our paraprofessionals, a lot of individuals that serve our students, our bus drivers as well, uh, the serve our students on a day-to-day -day basis aren't qualified to be in that earning. So we have an option to take the full amount that we receive of the 800,000 divided by the number of employees or use some of our local and st other state funds to help offset that $300,000 difference. And so uh, that's been our pattern that we've done the last few years uh, so that everyone's able to, to uh, receive that $1,000 or whatever the amount may be across the board. So just to make sure I understand, the, the state is paying us 800000 but we're paying out $1.1 million. And so the 800 comes in as revenue. The 300 difference is just from the general fund. Right. Okay. And that's why we want to add this, this added to the budget, because obviously it was not yeah. uh, in our initial. And, and we were able to pay that um, two Fridays ago? Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to, I uh, see all the people in the background nodding because they can. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we're, you know, we're, we're excited to be able to buy that and pass it on to our course. Make a motion to approve the budget amendment. Yes, yeah, so I would strongly encourage somebody to make a motion. Yeah. Yeah. They may not get out of the building alive. <laughs> <laughs> Got a motion by Mr. Norval and a second by Mr. Young. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Uh, Curious mind here, yeah. if I may. I mean, do you do you uh, hear from any peers with other school systems to where they're debating this? Yeah, there there were some I mean, to take the full amount of I don't see the, the total debate. number of employees to take care of. That. And what's very difficult is to publicly say, "Hey, we're giving everybody a thousand, and then you see you get eight hundred or seven hundred and fifty. Mm -hmm. That that's very difficult. Uh, to to accept. There are districts that take the full amount and divide because they may not have the financials that we do to be able to make that happen. Um, fortunately, uh, we're in a position where we can. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Any discussion on it? I do have one. I had some very concerned seniors at my house about where graduation is going to be held because they're seeing the stadium being torn up. Is it Plan to be well. That's why Mr. Green pleaded. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all against all. You better leave beforehand. Uh, our, our goal is to do it there. We will not have the upper stands available. Uh, we we are developing a primary plan and then a backup plan. Uh, we do have available space on the field that if we need to move some seating onto the field uh, in front of the PK Dixon Field House, we'll be able to do that. Uh, we actually had a meeting this morning uh, with Carol Daniel Construction or Architects RLR. To kind of look at their timeline of where everything is. And so now Mr. Niles, Mr. President, and I will meet with Mr. Green and figure out the primary plan and maybe a couple of backup plans. There's always the rain backup plan. Um, but but just in case to see can, what can where can we move and what will be accessible in late night. Also, just off the record, we did have a meeting where we shared this with seniors. And so okay. we did have some seniors who did not attend that meeting. <laughs> we did not receive. Probably hey, my child. <laughs> <laughs> Off the record, it's being recorded. Right? Oh, yeah. It's like, <laughs> probably a hard based on it. So, yes. <laughs> um, one item everybody's education. You want to talk about the article that Sammy sent yesterday regarding the, the COVID funds and our decision versus some of these boards and districts that may not be. Yeah, I'd be glad to. So when, when COVID came, there were three rounds of funds that districts received. It's easy to call them ESSER 1, 2, and 3, although the third one actually had a different name. ESSER 1, uh, we use those funds to help purchase Chromebooks for all of our students. Right when everything was coming in, I think we had to spend a little bit more than what we received, but it was, it was really tight. ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, when they came forward, 
they realize we can't just give money freely. We've got to have some checks and balances with it and some processes. And Ms. Shea Ray, Director of Federal Programs, about every six months we have to put out a survey or she'll give a report to the board, just something along those lines. And going through this before in the previous district when I worked at RISA, one of the things you don't want to do is take those ESSER funds and pour it into personnel. Uh, I do have some friends of mine who in their district, they used 80% or so of their ESSER funds to pay for personnel. Well, now those funds are ending. So either they're going to have to let staff members go at the end of the school year or bring all of them on using general and, and, and state funds or, or local and state funds. We only have six people currently paid right now out of our ESSER funds. Mm -hmm. um, Butler Center and that support is there, but also our mental health commission, that's it. Uh, we we early on we did have a couple of others that were paid for kind of as a way to let's see if this is a, a position that we want to bring over to the general fund. So we used it in a way to help uh, experiment may, may be the wrong word, but really see if if the payoff is worth it. And with a large part of ESSER going to learning loss, which we've used to pay for after school, the Boys and Girls Club, uh, our summer school programs that we've had, a lot of it goes to that. It also has to go to mental health services, and that's where we use those funds to help offset and support our mental health commission, which we're up to six uh, right now. So we're really looking forward to knowing that that's going to be coming over to the general fund. And Ms. Ms. Pethel and I have been talking about how much of that is coming over. So we, although the funds are drying up, we feel like we were positioned fairly well going into it to not put ourselves in the spot uh, to really struggle with it. So we use Chromebooks, uh, the employee laptops we were able to purchase through those funds as well, all of the summer school, the ESOL endorsement pieces, things that were really <laughs> value add to us as a system uh, versus we do not want to have that conversation of, sorry, funds are gone and now you need to be looking for employment elsewhere. We, we just did not think that was fair uh, to our employees or our community. So thank you, Mr. Stewart, for bringing that up. Well, that was a, a very wise decision. One of the administration's part, for sure. Any other discussion on Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Got a motion by Mr. Young. Do I hear a second? Second. Got a second by Dr. Ramsey. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.